It's our pleasure to have all of you with us uh, with our uh, webinar organized by GREM, Gynecological and Reproductive Endocrinology and Metabolism, to illustrate the authors who present their paper in our journal. I remind you, this is the issue, the uh, second issue of GREM of this year, and uh, with this beautiful series of fantastic papers. And we have chosen one of them, we have chosen one of them, which uh, the title is the genetic background of coagulation factor is associated with the presence of amenorrhea in girls with anorexia nervosa pilot study. Very, very interesting study and very new concept to face a very ancient problem. This study originated, was done in the University of Athens in the department of OBGYN, of uh, uh, pediatrics and of endocrinology. And we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Eleni Armeni. She is a graduate from the University of Athens and she has a lot of interest in the endocrine areas uh, who were, and she was, uh, she's one of the authors of that the paper. She's interested in ovarian failure, thyroid disorder, bone disease, metabolism and cardiovascular risk. And she has already published more than 17 articles in peer reviewer journals and her P and philosophy doctor thesis. Eleni, you have the microphone. We are all waiting you and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. Go on. Professor Giannazzani, thank you so much for the kind invitation to discuss the findings of this interesting study. This is a pilot study, a part of an ongoing trial, an ongoing observation study, I should much rather say, which was conceived originally in the Pediatric Endocrinology Department in Areteo Hospital, National and Capodestrian University of Athens, next to my mentor, Professor Lambrino Daki. So let's have a look about what is known and what is not known on this old problem and how we could potentially improve the life or the prognosis of this girls in this circumstance. Anorexia nervosa is a diagnose in the sense of a distorted self-perception of the body image and is primarily characterized by excessive fear of gaining weight. There are certain psychological criteria used, the list of which has been revised in 2013 as not directly related with psychology. I'm endocrinology as primary profession. I will not go too deeply into the psychological analysis of the criteria. The lifetime prevalence of this disorder, anorexia nervosa, according to the most latest results, most latest published data, data is considered to range between one and 4% in Western world. Everyone is recognizing the fact that this disorder is rather difficult to be diagnosed. The consequences of anorexia nervosa consist primarily of mood disorders, anxiety and depression, bone mass below the expected range for age, rather frequently secondary amenorrhea, which might also be primary but secondary most common, and according to recent evidence, it has been recognized that there are some underlying hematological and hemostasis disorders, which are rather not very well described. According to what is known until today, based on reports from 2018 and 2019, ladies or young girls diagnosed with anorexia nervosa are characterized by pancytopenia or bicytopenia, with decreased cellularity of the bone marrow. The aim of this study was in this small sample of adolescent girls diagnosed with anorexia nervosa to investigate the genetic background of coagulation factors according to the presence of oligo and or aminorrhea versus normal menstruation and to compare with a small sample of age-matched control girls with normal menstruation. This was a pilot study, therefore the sample was small. This, the sample of this study, of this pilot study, as we said, consisted of 40 young girls 
aged 14 until 17 years of age, which were recruited from the Child and Adolescent Gynecology Outpatient Clinic of the Second Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Aretean Hospital in Athens, Greece. Inclusion criteria consisted of a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa according to the American Psychiatry Association criteria, the list that was revised in 2013, a body mass index of 12.5 until 18.5, uh, corresponding to values below the fifth percentile of age. Exclusion criteria were the presence of current or previously diagnosed metabolic bone disease, use of hormone supplements or contraceptives, severe malnutrition due to other causes, or current smoking. The population of controls consisted of 10 age-matched girls with normal menstruation and no previous diagnosis of eating disorder. The protocol we followed for the procedures of this study included detailed medical history being obtained at the time of the very first visit of the girls to the clinic. We used questionnaires in order to obtain demographic, socioeconomic characteristics and also included some questions with regards to the self-esteem of the ladies in relation to their body weight and to the body overall. We assessed anthropometric parameters and more specifically the weight and the height of the ladies. Body mass index was calculated as per the typical algorithm, but in order to stratify the ladies, we use the BMI Z score that was calculated using the online calculator of the Children's Nutrition Research Center of the Baylor College of Medicine. Blood samples were obtained during the third until fifth day of the cycle or randomly in case of or amenorrhea or oligoaminorrhea where the start of the menstrual cycle could not be defined. Serum levels of estradiol were determined using standard laboratory techniques. This table is showing the genetic background of coagulation disorders in girls with anorexia nervosa versus controls. I will try to read through the features of the table with you. So we have the age that shows comparable results, comparable age range between the cases, the girls with anorexia nervosa and the controls. Body mass index, even though not statistically different, was obviously lower in the girls with anorexia nervosa. BMI Z score was minus 1.41, um, the mean value in the group of cases, minus 0 0.55 in the group of controls, borderline statistical difference. Duration of aminorrhea, Aminorrhea was evident only in the group of girls with anorexia nervosa as defined according to the original inclusion criteria. It was evident in the 80%, not the whole sample of the girls with anorexia nervosa. With regards to genetics now, the glycoprotein 3A LOI33 Pro GLP 3A, 2B is the other name used for this polymorphism, was found in variably within the group of girls with anorexia nervosa. So the wild type was evident in the 72.5% of girls. Heterozygous carriers of the polymorphism, 22.5%. Homozygous carriers, 5%. The group of controls, surprisingly, were not carrying any polymorphic variant. With regards to the genetic polymorphism of the prothrombin gene, and this is the specified mutation we analyzed, we found comparable results with 95% of the girls with anorexia nervosa being carriers of the wild type, while 90% of the controls were carrying the wild type gene. 
carriers of at least one heterosic, one uh, polymorphic variant was found to be two girls in the total of the um, uh, whole study sample of anorexia nervosa girls, while only one was evident in the group of controls. Some differences, but not statistically significant, were found with regards to the MTHFR A1298C polymorphism, wild type, comparable prevalence between cases and controls, heterozygous carriers of the polymorphic variant, slightly superior with regards to the girls with anorexia nervosa. There was increased prevalence with 25%. Homozygous carriers, slightly less, 7.5%, corresponding to three girls in a total of 40, while homozygous carriers of the polymorphic variant in the control group, we found only one girl. Let's try to see what it means, though, all of these differences with regards to carrying a wild-type polymorphism, a, a, a wild-type gene of this assessed polymorphism, or actually the polymorphic variant, between our girls with anorexia nervosa and the girls defined as control. We continued by comparing the presence of at least one mutation of each of the assessed polymorphisms or a combination of the mutations between girls with anorexia nervosa and controls. So, first significant result was the fact that the presence of either mutation, either glycoprotein 3A or prothrombin gene, was significantly more frequent in the group of girls with anorexia nervosa. Secondarily, the combination of the polymorphic variant of the glycoprotein 3A gene or MTHFR gene was also significantly more frequent in the girls with anorexia nervosa as opposed to controls. Lastly, a borderline difference was found with regards to the glycoprotein 3A polymorphic variant when assessing the presence of at least one mutation between girls with anorexia nervosa and controls. Indeed, the p-value indicates non-clear statistical difference, but considering the fact that this is a pilot study and the sample size is so small, we did consider that a value between 0.05 and 0.1 could be considered as indicative of a possible difference. This is the reason I'm discussing this result in more detail. After this approach, we continued trying to explore possible factors that may or may not be linked with disorders of menstruation. Therefore, we grouped the girls differently this time. The first column corresponds to the girls with anorexia nervosa presenting as oligo or aminorrhea, which could also be regarded as the more severe form of anorexia nervosa, while the second column is referring to the girls with normal menstruation, which was 20% of the anorexia nervosa group and the control group together. Let's see what happened with regards to differences of polymorphic variants. So the glycoprotein 3A polymorphic variant was highly significant, more prevalent, up to 30.3% in cases presenting with anorexia nervosa and disorders of menstruation. The combination of having at least one of the mutations, either GP3A or prothrombin mutation, resulted also in a statistical significant result. More significantly, we have to mention that the girls with anorexia nervosa presenting with this severe form of it, which means oligo or aminorrhea, had a combination of this polymorphic variants in 36.4% of cases, while the girls with diagnosis of anorexia nervosa but no menstrual disorders, plus the control girls, so the second group, had prevalence of this 
combination of polymorphic variants estimated as 5.9%. Lastly, the third combination that was proven to be statistically significant was the combination between the polymorphic variant of the gene GP3A or MTHFR, so presence of at least one mutation of either of those genes in the group of severely affected anorexia nervosa girls was to be found in 6.6% of the time, so 20 girls, while it was rather not very frequent in the group of girls with normal menstruation. We continued exploring possible association between the presence of oligo or amenorrhoeas or menstruation disorders as opposed to normal menstruation according to the presence of possible risk factors which were regarded each and every one of the combinations of genetic polymorphisms or the simple genetic polymorphism, glycoprotein 3A, that was found to be significant in the previous univariate analysis, adjusting for various traditional factors like the age of the girl, the BMI Z score, having elevated rather normal levels of estradiol as opposed to hypoestrogenism. Uh, as well as a diagnosis of anorexia nervosa versus lack thereof. This was the most significant model, which resulted in the, the following conclusions. This model showed that a combination of the genetic polymorphism of prothrombin or glycoprotein 3A is associated with higher odds of menstrual irregularity or even amenorrhea and this association is also influenced by levels of estrogen which obviously act protectively which means higher levels of estrogen reduce the risk for oligo or amenorrhea. It was rather surprising to see that the presence of oligo or amenorrhea as opposed to normal menstruation was not predicted by the diagnosis itself per se and was not associated with the BMI Z score. With regards to the remaining statistical models, the, the significance, the statistical significance of the genetic polymorphisms was lost after adjustment for the traditional risk factors. Both of the second and third model continue to indicate the significance of higher estrogen, or at least regulated estrogen, in girls that develop oligo or amenorrhea, especially in the context of being diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. So in conclusion, the results of this study show that adolescents with severe anorexia nervosa defined as low body mass index plus oligo or aminorrhea have higher prevalence of the glycoprotein 3A LOI33 mutation in at least one polymorphic variant as opposed to girls with anorexia nervosa but experiencing less complications or control girls. All of the assessed polymorphic variants of the thrombotic panel are related with a higher risk of menstrual disorders in the univariate analysis. However, the multivariate analysis showed that the presence of at least one polymorphic variant from the panel glycoprotein 3A or prothrombin is associated with higher odds of abnormal menstruation. Let's have a look to see if we can explain these findings in the context of what is known from the literature. But before that, I will continue with the limitations of this study. It has to be recognized once again that this is a pilot study. So the findings are truly preliminary and mainly indicative. The cross-sectional design does not permit causative association to be established. We did have some missing values which did not allow further possible evaluation of the link between the genetic polymorphism and levels of platelets or the platelet volume and we did not have any platelet function studies. This is to be considered for the full study when we manage to complete. With regards to what is known, 
An interesting study in 2019 describes that neuromodulatory signs reducing the pulse waves of GnRH are the induction of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis and hypercortisolemia, nutritional deprivation and reduction of leptin from loss of body fat, excessive exercise with negative caloric balance, external stressors and stressful events, which means that reduction in functional GnRH waves results into lower LH pulse frequency, lower concentrations of LH and FSH, and consequently suboptimal folliculogenesis. This is already expected and did happen, but rather in 80% of cases, while the remaining 20% of ladies did not present menstrual irregularities, irrespectively of their nutritional deprivation and the reduction of leptin from losing body fat. Some biographically known predictive factors of amenorrhea in ladies with anorexia nervosa are obviously mostly linked with low fat deposits. But the question here is possibly further studies that would be needed and will be needed in trying to investigate the consequences that are happening in girls with amenorrhea or late, sorry, in uh, girls or ladies with anorexia nervosa that is diagnosed as typical as opposed to atypical, which means those which have a body mass index within the higher range of the respective cutoff rather than the typical ones which have, which have the very low BMI. Difficult to explain uh, is the situation, therefore, in intermediate states of body weight, like, as we said before, the atypical anorexia nervosa. There is a complicated interaction between the hormone profile, menstrual characteristics, like the type of bleeding and co coagulation disorders. But unfortunately, data is available primarily on heavy menstrual bleeding, which is more clear. However, cases of oligoaminorrhea states are less frequently studied. In this context, there may be an association with certain polymorphisms of genes implicated in the coagulation process. And the results of this pilot study seem to confirm this rather general but sound pathophysiological hypothesis. Anorexia nervosa may actually be related with a background of genetic of disorders with regards to coagulation. Hemostasis is known to be affected in states of anorexia nervosa to some extent. Unfortunately, even this is not sufficiently studied. Severe anorexia nervosa is associated with decreased bone marrow cellularity affecting at least two cell lines. Recognized platelet, hi platelet hyperaggregability uh, is the case, and this is partly due to increased adrenoreceptor density. Some, a case control study reported a few years ago described compared 67 cases of anorexia nervosa versus 67 controls reporting high frequency of thrombocytopenia and bicytopenia in up to 10 and 13.4% of cases, respectively. While a retrospective study of 318 patients with anorexia nervosa reports thrombocytopenia to be the case in 8.9%. We would definitely suggest to continue investigating hemostatic and hematological features and possibly disorders in the group of these girls in order to be able to better on to get a, gain a better understanding of the complications they experience and consequently in order to be able to help them. There are some studies investigating the genetic background in girls with anorexia nervosa, and these are extremely recent, ongoing, so results are not really published yet. Only methodology and the main features of the groups have been published. 
Eating Disorders Genetics Initiative is a large study that managed to register 14,500 patients with eating disorders, which will be compared with 1,500 controls aiming to identify differences with regards to genetic polymorphic variants between cases with eating disorders and controls. Secondarily, another important one is the Anorexia Nervosa Genetic Initiative with 3,414 Australians, which will be compared with 540, sorry, will be, will be combined with 543 New Zealands, meeting lifetime anorexia nervosa case criteria. The ultimate primary endpoint is the same to identify differences with regards to genetic polymorphisms as opposed to controls. Lastly, the Eating Disorders Working Group of Psychiatric Genomics Consortium provided data for meta-analysis, which is expected to incorporate the findings of the very first initiative, the ETGI study, when, and the result should be a genome-wide association study with a total of 16,992 patients with anorexia nervosa and 55,525 controls. The possible implications of this small pilot study are the fact that severe anorexia nervosa may be associated or at least seems to be associated with higher frequency of genetic polymorphisms of the thrombotic panel. This might have implications with regards to the platelet function, might have implications with regards to the menstruation, and could possibly affect the cardiovascular risk of these ladies. Suggestions for future research would involve that eating disorders and the severity of their complications, mostly focusing on anorexia nervosa, as it is so unusual, but also affecting the lives of so many young girls and women, should be evaluated thoroughly by large scale studies, which could potentially evaluate associations of genetic polymorphisms using Mendelian randomization, or even trying to, ex to explore possible complex interactions between the genetic polymorphisms. Lastly, the genome-wide association studies are definitely needed to explore the extent of gene-environment interaction in this cohort. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Armiani. Thank you very much for that fantastic lecture, which opened now uh, a huge series of questions and interest also for the future. I invite all the, our, uh, the people with us to send me by chat using the chat system to send me their question. And then I would like to start with one of them. As you know, to have an adolescent anorexia nervosa is also a very high risk to have anorexia nervosa in your uh, more advanced time of age. Then page adult with anorexia nervosa a great part of them, they had also they were starting in adolescence. And one of the uh, death causes, you know, anorexia nervosa was associated with a great incidence of premortality. <laughs> the number of the people with anorexia nervosa, they have a higher risk of sudden death. And in the sudden death, the cardiovascular aspects is one of the most prominent. And then I would like that you can make some comment about it. With regards to the cardiovascular risk of these girls, this is a very complicated topic, but also very important because they bear a specific risk related with possibly the genetic background, secondarily with the low estrogen, which puts them on the metabolic complications of hypoestrogenism. And uh, therefore, it would be very important to try to optimize the treatment of these girls as soon as possible, once we confirm the diagnosis, in order to be able to avoid any further complications. Thank you. Thank you very much. And another point related to your, uh, the population of your, uh, of your study. You know, when we see the data of the population of your study, I was impressed by that slide showing the characteristic of the, of the, uh, 
uh, of the control group. And uh, thinking that what is the characteristic of the control group of uh, young uh, individuals uh, that we have in, uh, in Italy or also that we see in the normal roads. And I have seen that your uh, body mass index, uh, which in fact was very indicated that your population, in your population, the distribution of the body weight were more oriented to thin person also in the control group, independent yeah. anorexia nervosa, this is clear because, you know, in anorexia nervosa, uh, certainly the body mass index is of reduced size, but also the body mass index of your population. Then the question is, are you uh, in the future, uh, are you sure that uh, this is really representing for, the, uh, for that age, the normal distribution of body mass index in your controls? Considering the fact that the control group is rather really small, it's only 10 girls, we have to take, first of all, this into account before we decide on uh, regarding this control group as truly representative. But also, I have to mention that while choosing the control group, we try to avoid including excessive states of um, body weight as this should aim as a control group with which uh, ladies with anorexia nervosa would be compared so we could not really include overweight girls in order to be able to have a true comparison with with the body weight not really being a confounder okay thank you thank you very much and then also another another question uh, this is uh, a sample of a very young uh, individual with anorexia nervosa. Uh, do you are aware if any other was making similar studies in adult anorexia nervosa? In, uh, in older individuals, individual, individual yeah. over 30, 40, not in adolescent time, to see if uh, this uh, kind of genetic variance, this specific distribution is also present in an adult population of anorexia nervosa? That is a very interesting question. Um, I did try to read into the genomide association studies, all the studies comparing anorexia nervosa ladies with uh, relative controls. And uh, this, uh, the only gene that has been studied before is the MTHFR. Yeah. So the remaining genes were not really investigated. And uh, the reason that we have chosen this panel of genes, of genetics, was the fact that we wanted to expand into the whole thrombotic panel and rather than to be limited only into MTHFR itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, I'm looking if there are questions. OK. Uh... Oh, then Michael Samaha is asking, then on the basis of your data, do you believe that should we be cautious in prescribing hormone therapy? Uh, if we recall the results of the multivariable analysis, you might be able to remember, if not, I'm all, always happy to, re to show the slide again, that low estrogen was actually the strongest factor been associated with menstrual irregularity, irregularity in all of the girls. So in trying to in understand the genetics behind and the possible thrombotic risks of those girls, as this is only a pilot study, let's not undermine the significance of normalizing the estrogens. So my answer would be no, I would not be cautious in using HRT until results as such are confirmed by larger studies which would be able to give guidelines for the whole population or probably it should be interesting uh, going in that way that probably we can use more transcutaneous estrogen administration you know in, because the problem of uh, estroprogestin therapy is the problem of the impact of oral estrogen on the liver then they should use the transcutaneous estrogen and oral didrogesterone, for example. That is a very, very good point, uh, which I do hope we will continue considering all of us. <laughs> Thank you. And then you have a question from uh, uh, Kotar Irakiu Saini. He has he mentioned that he have a case. He have a clinical case of anorexia menorrhea gastritis with with hyperplasia on endoscopic biopsy and and prolactinemia slightly elevated. And he asks you, what please, what should be your approach? 
So we have anorexia, anorexia, amenorrhea, gastritis, with hyperprolactinemia. With and hyperprolactinemia. Yes, like hyperprolactinemia. It depends on. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's important to know, first of all, how high the level of prolactin in is and as to whether or not this is related with the menstrual disorder itself, because it might be stress related hyperprolactinemia or it might be barely elevated without causing significant symptoms and with no, with no structural problem with regards to the pituitary. So I would exclude any cause of prolactinemia to start with, any actual cause of prolactinemia. Uh, if there is nothing functionally linked with the prolactinemia, if the pituitary is clear, then I would continue on, on as Professor Janantani said before, on transdermal, uh -huh. uh, in, uh, transdermal hormone replacement. Yeah, then, then it's uh, Professor Massimo. Massimo Giusti is asking if you have any data about IGF-1 in these patients. I'm afraid not. Funding was an issue, so we don't have. Yes, yes. I, I think I would like to go with, uh, with Eleni on that point. But I think uh, your data are strongly suggestive that we have to take care more also of the aspects uh, of possible uh, thrombotic risk of these patients in general. And uh, by that way, I would like uh, that, uh, Eleni, you can go on a little bit more on the possible uh, utility of the transcutaneous gel administration of estradiol instead to have an oral treatment and then to give a good progestogen which uh, in this age group should be didrogesterone at 5 or 10 milligram to protect endometrium. What uh, did you, Can you uh, spend a little bit more about uh, this and the possible risk of oral, uh, uh, oral estrogen administration on coagulation, mainly if we have a population, as you have seen, that they have uh, in uh, a significant uh, uh, number any some possible genetic variants who can who are open to possible risk. So, with if we consider that this group of ladies will and they might have some possible thrombotic risk, this possible hypercoagulability that might stand behind this genetic disorders could most likely be um, induced to a higher level by using oral hormone replacement. Hormone replacement, we have to recognize, this is important for these girls in order to minimize the risk from the low estrogens and to protect their vessels. So by using transdermal version of estrogens together with some tra transdermal preparations, together with some progesterone in order to be able to protect the uterus, we will be able to possibly in affect the liver by improving the production of coagulation factors. So that way, the risk of a thrombosis or DVT in this specific state could be regulated in the future. Now, this data is for no means implying that HRD should not be used in these girls because they actually need it they are at a reproductive age at which their ovaries should be functioning normally. But providing alternative ways with less of an effect to the liver, with no first impact pass of the liver to any oral estrogens, that would mean benefiting clinically from normal levels of estrogen, their bone health being optimized because of normal levels of estrogen. And that would actually imply lower risk of any adverse effect related with having to use hormone replacement in the specific group. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like also to add something on this point, which is that uh, as we have to use a, a progestogen, as you know, micronized progesterone per vaginam should be the best way. But sometimes the girl, they don't have had any sexual activity or intercourse and so on. And then in that young population group, I suggest that oral didrogesterone, not so much oral progesterone, because oral progesterone is also widely metabolized to allopregnanolone and then the allopregnanolone increase, sudden increase 
can bring to some uh, hypnotic effect, uh, some, uh, and then this can touch the vigilance of the patient and then can be open to any, to some risk. While didrogesterone, even though if it is very close to a structure to progesterone, cannot be transformed to allopregnanolone. It's not metabolized. And then don't give any effect on vigilance, uh, on attention, on sleep. Uh, and then it can be, it can be also better used for oral administration. But transcutaneous estrogen is very, very important. And I would like to give, as we have the microphone, I would like to give the, uh, the to make also the comment, if you give oral estrogen or you give transcutaneous estrogen, you have also to evaluate the circulating estradiol that you achieve to be sure that the amount that you are given can reach at least the uh, 12 hours after the administration concentration of around 70 to 90 picogram of estradiol, as Dr. Uh, Armeni was telling us, who are important for to maintain the bone, to achieve the bony mass, the body, uh, the bone mass peak, and to protect uh, the, all the estrogen sensitive tissue. I want to go to see if we have another question. No, there we have no further question. I would like to ask you, Eleni, do you, I would like to have, uh, you know, a, a general comment, a general comment and a general suggestion that you give us once that we face a young girl who is developing an anorexia nervosa. A general comment would be, first of all, what we're doing or should be doing, which is lifestyle modification to improve the weight, which however can be a huge challenge in these girls. Yes. And at the same time, the stressors could potentially be regulated by themselves, but that still will be time consuming. Don't underestimate the benefit from hormone replacement. That would be my uh, trying, to, however, to rationalize the use so that the girl will be able to benefit in full. Thank you very much. And then also I would like to add even more to Eleni. Uh, as I was mentioning, it's uh, important uh, to have uh, to have uh, an adequate treatment which cannot rise the uh, which cannot rise the uh, thrombotic risk, and if if uh, contraception is needed, if contraception is needed, I would like to mention you the use of progestogen only contraception, progestogen only contraception added with transcutaneous estrogen, because. Uh, for the contraception is they are not needed, but for the female body at that age, even though if they are of low bone mass density, uh, we need also to add some transcutaneous administration of estradiol, one milligram, 1.5 milligram a day, in addition to an oral uh, progestogen only contraception. I would like to have your comment, Eleni. I can I'm just in full agreement with what you're saying, <laughs> Professor. It's what is pleasant in this kind of talk. It is that very spontaneous, eh? And you know, <laughs> I I rise I rise questions and comments directly <laughs> linked to the Ellen Armeni presentation, which was beautiful. I would like to make uh, oh, okay, we have seen some questions coming. Uh, one second, we will see. If there are only one other, okay. Uh, ooh, yes, uh, what contraception would you use in adolescent uh, with uh, in adolescent uh, with uh, uh, TGA? We have already mentioned, and David. Uh, Okay, the question from Michael uh, Samaha is, uh, it would be interesting to follow this patient during their pregnancies, if they reach the pregnancy, yeah? to see if they will have more obstetrical complications, such preeclampsia and so on. Do you have any information about this? It is also a very interesting thought, and one should be reminded that, first of all, the situation is very rare. While we need some documentation system or at least be able to go back to the history of ladies achieving pregnancy a, so that we can collect ladies who have 
might or might not be currently pregnant with a previous history of anorexia nervosa in order to to follow them up during the pregnancy and recognize as to whether or not they do develop any complications. Unfortunately, the topic is rather novel and not well studied yet. So there is no study available and we do have no data either with regards to what happens with regards to thrombotic complications in these ladies around the pregnancy, at least to my knowledge. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. No, no, I think you see, and then we have uh... One last question about the possible use of implanon. Yes, okay, about the possible use of implanon. I think, you know, in anorexia nervosa, we have no studies about the use of implanon and implanon feasibility and the concept of, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, menstrual bleeding profile of implanon. I think, you know, the anorexia nervosa patients is a, is a is an individual who in any case have a very severe and complicated situation that we have to face. We have to be able to bring up out from the anorexia nervosa that girl, otherwise her destiny will be marked for her, all her uh, life. And then I think uh, uh, I would like to suggest more uh, eventually a uh, progestogen only contraception with transcutaneous uh, a stradiol administration one, 1.5 to milligram a day to maintain an adequate estrogenization of the female body because we have also to mind that uh, these girls, uh, they also, they have uh, a huge problem with self-esteem and with self-image. And then some amount of estrogenization, this could rise both of them, either the sense of self-esteem, either the self-image, also because this can provide a greater sensitivity to the breast tissue to progestogen. And if you have a progestogen only contraception, this can also slightly stimulate the growth of the breast. What is your comment about that one, Eleni? Uh, we should revisit the clinical praxis because the base to the latest uh, at the um, latest guidelines <laughs> available on hormone therapy, I believe many, many colleagues might have might still think with a great concern with regards to hormone replacement therapy. So if they actually get to engage themselves with the newest guidance to see that people who can benefit more from the trend as people of this category, so girls with anorexia nervosa would benefit truly from a combination as such from trans transthermal estrogen and the progesterone pill. I would anticipate that their fear of using either contraceptives or hormone replacement therapy would start lowering and the, uh, we're going to see a clinical benefit in our girls by trying to alter, only to adapt the practice, practices that are um, available around us. Thank you. And also, and also I would like to uh, put you a question about the nutritional status, the nutritional impact. What have to be our suggestion in the, because anorexia nervosa, you know, is, uh, is a psychiatric disease. It's not so much, it's not an eating disorder only because she, are, she have a complicated eating. And then what is your believing about the, 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 the participation of a psychiatrist in the team and what kind of, of care have to be done? With regards to a direct in participation of the psychiatrist in the team, that might be rather difficult considering the time restraints uh, endocrinological or gynecological consultation would face as opposed to a psychological consultation that would take longer. However, a direct uh, link with a nutritionist or dietitian that will be able to give firm advice to the girls on what they can choose in order to have a diet nutritious full in the nutrients they need in order to maintain and start to improve the body weight without ge getting unnecessary fat or without over consuming unhealthy products that would also be very very important so uh, let's say a triangle between the primary endocrinology and ecological care with the psychiatrist and the dietitian that should be type of an mdt in order to manage these girls Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. You know, I think that from uh, this uh, study from Eleni Armeni, uh, Eleni Armeni and all the group uh, and chaired by Irene Rambrinudaki, 
uh, we have seen a novel aspects of possible risk associated with the development of anorexia nervosa. And anorexia nervosa as a marker of a possible increase of uh, uh, disorders in coagulating uh, profile, which in the gynecology is open to plenty of possible other risk situations. I would like to mention the pregnancy. I want to mention also contraception. I want to mention hormone replacement therapy, everything. Then, dear friends, I think that we have to thank that beautiful team of the fantastic paper. And uh, we will have, uh, uh, as announced, we will have in August no other uh, webinar on the paper published on GREM. And in September, we will have another very interesting paper, uh, which, will be, which will be presented by the team of uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Jola. And uh, I would like just to mention, and uh, it will be also a very attractive uh, topic, uh, which will be bone, metabolic, and anthropometric changes in very young women with premature ovarian insufficiency or complete androgen insensitivity syndrome with removed gonads using oral estradiol valerate, transdermal estradiol, or oral ethinyl estradiol, a pilot study. Then another beautiful study, which will be ready in, uh, which will be for discussion in September. I invite all of you to send your paper on Gram Gynecological and Reproductive Endocrinology and Metabolism, submit your art in manuscript, and the accepted manuscript will be uh, for this year's will be published for free. This is an open invitation to everybody. And I thank uh, very much uh, the uh, presence uh, of Eleni Armeni and the beautiful group of Professor Lambrinudaki, which was uh, with us today for that fantastic lecture. Eleni, have a good time, enjoy the life, stay safe with the COVID, make vaccination, suggest vaccination, the world needs vaccination for an happy time for everybody. Goodbye and good summer.